you guys. It's so good to see all of you. It's such a blessing. And I think there were more than the last time I turned around and looked out there. So, wow. I'm glad you all made it today. Uh, today, like I told the kids, we're going to talk about temptation. Yeah, all right, yeah. So, we're going to be looking in, in Matthew primarily. And we're going to look at the temptations of Jesus. I just want to look at Matthew 4, 1 here. It says, then... Was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And you can imagine that. Now, just let me set the scene a little bit. You probably know this anyway. But Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. And it happened right after he was baptized. It happened right after the heavens open up and God himself declares that this is my son. Right after one of the biggest mountaintop experiences you can kind of figure you'd have, when God just proclaims his love for you and his acceptance of you from the heavens, then he's led to the wilderness for temptation. That's not an isolated thing. As a matter of fact, as we look at this story, none of it is isolated. What happened to Jesus happens to us. You have one of those really great spiritual moments in your life, and watch and see if temptation doesn't come on the heels. If wilderness doesn't come on the heels of it. You know, it happens. And it shouldn't be surprising to us, although it, it oftentimes is. We're doing so good. We have such a, we have arrived, right? And then something just happens. <coughs> we goof something up, something goofed up happens to us. Just something happens. And we think, oh my goodness. What a surprise that is. Don't be surprised. It's kind of the way of things sometimes. <clears throat> you know, we use those times of intense closeness to give us the strength to go into the wilderness. I would argue that actually, as we look around in our world today, the wilderness is kind of the place where we live. You know? And sometimes we get these experiences of just being lifted up by God. And those strengthen us. And they encourage us to get back into it. I do not believe Christianity is a spectator sport. I believe every one of us is called to be off the bench and in the game. I believe that with all my heart. And I, I work. I don't want to be benched. You know? I don't want to be sidelined. I want to be out in the fight. I want to be in the game. I want to be loving people for Jesus. And so we have to deal with these things. And as we look at the fact that it says that Jesus was led in the spirit out into the wilderness. I want you to think about that. I would challenge you to find any other time. Now, the same thing is recorded in Luke, and uh, there's like two verses in Mark. But so the same story is recorded in three of the Gospels, so I don't mean there. But find another time when Jesus had to be led anywhere. He kind of knew where he was going. He knew what was going on. But this time, the Spirit led him. Because this was going to be something kind of special. And there, even in the Lord's Prayer, I think if we put this together with when he's telling his disciples how to pray, and part of that prayer is, lead us not into temptation. I think that little piece had a lot of meaning for the man that was led into temptation. The Spirit led him to this place, and he suffered there in this. And I think when he said, hey, you know, you be praying, this doesn't happen to you. But if it does, pray that you're delivered from evil. Those, those two lines just make so much more sense when you think about where Jesus has already been. But then comes this argument among uh, people, Christians, non-Christians alike. How could Jesus really be tempted? He's God. He's also man. All man, all God. 
And that is so hard to get our heads around, is it not? And so I'm going to say something here. Don't fire me. You could disagree with me, and I'm completely okay with that. But this is the only way I can think of that this works. And for most of Jesus' life, I think it's the only way that this works. That he willingly set aside the power of his divinity in order to live life as a man. If he hadn't set aside the power of his divinity, he never would have been tired. He never would have been hungry. He never would have had a struggle or a trial. Nothing would have harmed him if he hadn't set aside the power of his divinity. Now we see places where he takes that back just a little bit and does some stuff. We see places where that happens. But I don't believe that's the norm. I think the norm was Jesus living as a man, although still being fully God. But leaving the power of it, choosing not to access the power of it, when the accessing of that power is for himself. I want you to take a look. Anytime Jesus used the power of his divinity, was it for him that he did it? I don't believe so. And as he goes into the wilderness to be tried and tempted, he's, he's experiencing this as a man, setting aside the power of that divinity. Because if he hadn't, the next section is not going to make any sense at all. But as we go through this, I want you to think about the comparisons here. One of the arguments is, well, he couldn't have sinned because he had no nature to sin, because he was perfect. It's, a, it's an argument. It's wrong, but it's an argument. Um, Adam, in the garden, he was created perfect. He had no nature of sin in him. Matter of fact, the nature of sin came because of him, not that he ever had it. So being sinless and faced with that opportunity to sin because of the lies of Satan, the Bible tells us Eve was deceived, Adam chose to sin. If there's not a possibility of failure, it is not a test. I'm just going to tell you that. I cannot believe at all that Jesus was tempted if he didn't have the opportunity to fail the test. It's not really temptation that way. So Adam, being perfect, failed. The Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. He's perfect. He has the opportunity, but we're going to watch him do it right. He never failed. And that's, I think, so important for us. In Matthew 4, 3, it says, When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Now, the Bible tells us that in every way, Jesus was tempted like we are. Now, I've heard people over the years make the argument, well, you know, I've got this temptation or that temptation, this thing or that thing, and Jesus didn't have that. i got to tell you something. I firmly believe that if you spend 40 days without eating, I don't care what other temptation you want to think about, you're going to jump over that to eat. I mean, that there is so much inside of you screaming to eat. Your survival mechanism, your stomach, everything wants to eat. If it's a desire to fulfill a human need, be met it right here. You're, you're not going to face a bigger one than that. Now, you can take those human desires and you can spread them across a, a whole field of different things. Yeah, but it's really going to come down to making the right decision, and that's what he did. So he's faced with this decision, and if he hadn't set his God, godly, divine power aside, he wouldn't have had been hungry. He wouldn't have even been able to be hungry, but he was pretty hungry. The Bible tells us that, and he's faced with a decision. Now, is it sinful to, if you can make bread to make bread? I don't think so. But I want you to see why. One of the biggest parts of this, if, if you're the Son of God, 
and do this. Satan didn't show up and say, hey, buddy, how you doing? Let's eat. He challenged him. Prove yourself to me. Prove yourself in a way that's going to fulfill that need you're feeling right now, but prove to me who you are. And it, it, actually, as we go through this, you're going to see three different names for Satan. And in the Old Testament and the New Testament, a lot of names um, were about character. And we see here the tempter, the one who entices and draws us away from the things of God. And that's where we feel it a lot, isn't it? As we feel that enticing, that, that drawing away. And in the garden, what was it? It was just a little tweaking of what God said. A little bit of truth and a little bit of lie. And here he is, challenging Jesus to prove himself. And the answer comes straight out of the book of De Deuteronomy. The answer, he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This God spoke to the children of Israel while he was taking care of them in the wilderness. Jesus is in the wilderness, knowing he's going to be taken care of. And it, it's not like we have different stories going on in the Bible. It's just a story. And so he meets this with the word of God. We know, I hope, I know, God is enough. I don't have to do something else to help God out. You know? I don't have to do it my way instead of God's way. Because his is enough. He is right. And you know, we live in a world, we live in a wilderness where they want to say that God isn't right. That, that, that Bible that we want to look to for instruction, it's old, it's out of date, it's useless, it doesn't matter anymore. Actually, it just doesn't really even say what you think it says. Well, go read it again, because it still says the same thing. God is right. Truth is truth. We talked about that in Sunday school today. I mean, truth isn't what your opinion of it is. Truth just is. It's kind of like gravity. It just is. You jump off the top of a building, you are going to fall. I don't care if you believe you're going to fall or not. You jump in front of a moving truck, you're probably going to die. It doesn't matter if you think you're not going to. Your opinion doesn't matter when it comes to truth. And truth is, God is right. And his word is enough. So Jesus met the challenge with that. Sometimes we're challenged too. To prove this, to prove that, to be this, to be that. Just love God and love others. Matthew 4, 5 says this. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Now, you got to understand, that was pretty high up. The temple was a huge edifice, and the, the pinnacle was on top of that. And he said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. If you are the Son of God, just chuck yourself right off of you. I believe that one of the disciples was actually killed that way later on. They threw him from the top of the house. And he says here, for it's written. Oh, look at this. Did you know the enemy knows what's in the book? Yeah. I don't think he read the end, but he knows what's in the book. And here, the, the word up in, four, in verse 5, devil, that's a little different than the uh, tempter. This one like means like a false accuser. And, you know, before he was challenged to use his power to prove who he is by supplying the need to his body. And now, it's more of a pride thing. Use, use your power, use what God has said about you to jump off the building and prove to me who you are. If you really are the Son of God, prove it. And then he uses scripture. Oh my goodness, is that even fair? He says, for it's written, 
He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. That's from Psalms. The devil used scripture. The wilderness out there, they might twist the word of God around. But you know, the thing is, when you do stuff like that, it doesn't make it right. Now what he said here, that was scripture, that was right. But it wasn't right for Jesus to apply it in that sense. And Jesus knew that. So his response in verse 7, Jesus said to him, It's written, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God, or put the Lord your God to the test, I think some of your translations might say. And that goes back to Deuteronomy as well, but it goes back to Deuteronomy as a quote of something that happened back in Exodus. The thing that happened way back in Exodus is when the people asked, is God even with us? Is God even with us? See, his response to the challenge there is that it's sinful, that it's wrong for us to doubt God. See, if he had jumped off the building just to prove that what God said in his word was right, that's the same thing as saying, well, I just don't really know he's with me. I don't really know, I mean, he's promised to be, right? He has promised to never leave us, to never forsake us, so to wonder, to say, I don't believe it. It's kind of wrong. For Jesus to jump off that building and say, I'm going to do it just to show you something about God. That's, that's not what it's for. It's not why he gives those promises to us. So that we can show off in front of other people. Even if the temptation is there. Jesus knew that. And he met it with scripture again. Now I want you to think about his wilderness and our wilderness. I love our wilderness. Man, I tell you this last week, going to school and back. And with the time change, I get to go to school with the daylight still. The sun's up and, oh. I don't know if there's a prettier place in the county than just the drive between here and the town. It is so nice going down that hill. But when Jesus went in the wilderness, it wasn't like that. And see, I'm showing pictures of our wilderness with the slides, but I didn't have any of his. But we're talking a few scrub plants here and there, and hills and rocks and dirt, and a lot of dry. And Mark would tell us, his contribution to the story really was just one little piece of thing that Jesus was with the wild animals. And it's another kind of picture back to the garden. You know, Jesus walked around lions and snakes and all kinds of stuff out in that wilderness. It was really easy to die in the Judean wilderness. I'm just going to let you know. You didn't even have other people helping you. You could just really die out there easily. But Jesus walked among them just like Adam walked among the animals. It didn't bother him. He was just with them. But bothered him was Satan. And he's walked around, he's constantly still hungry. And we know, we know it started after about 40 days. We don't really know how long it went on. We just know there's pretty much three separate events. Matter of fact, in Mark's um, description of them, he actually puts two of them in a different order. doesn't make either one of them wrong. Because nobody is saying this, then this, then this. It's just these events happen. I like the, the flow in Matthew. That's why I'm using his. Then there was one last one. In 4.8, again, the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Can you imagine that? The absolute nerve of our enemy. I mean, put God on the hill and say, Worship me. 
But again, it's a temptation. It has to be. The temptation for power. You know, if he was going to live out as a man, all the power and all the kingdoms, he'd have it all. But you know, there's a higher power. He knows, Jesus knows, as a man, there is a bigger authority than him. There is even a bigger authority than the one who is tempting him. I want you guys to think about that for a second. When we fall victim to, temp victim to temptation, when these temptations come upon us, when we're in the wilderness and stuff happens and we're tempted to do something other than what God would have us do, understand, there is a bigger authority than you and I. And here is one of the biggest pieces of the problem between us and the rest of the world right now. Most of the world does not want to acknowledge that there's any authority above them. They want mankind to be the ultimate authority. I think that's extremely sad. I can't even get my head around the fact that any truth where we are the top of everything, what a sad commentary that would be. Because I see how we act. But we're not. There is an authority above me and you. There is an authority above the one who tempts us. There is someone higher than the one, the force, whatever it is that's coming against you. I choose just to go to the top. I choose to follow the one at the top. Now, that doesn't mean I'm perfect. I make mistakes like other people. But those times when I stop and I think about it, and I hope as I get older I stop and think about things more, it becomes more clear that God is above the temptation. He's above me. He's above the one that might be coming against me. He's above my circumstances. He's above my problems. He's above it all. And I trust Him. And He's right. Always. So, with the temptation to just have everything, you ever thought about that? What if I was tempted with everything? I got whatever, everything in the world. I was in charge of it all. Oh my goodness, I would never want that. But if that was a temptation for you, what would you do for it? Well, Jesus was met with that. And here's his answer. And at this point, I, I believe he just finished the encounter. It says, Jesus answered him, Get thee hence, Satan, that's King James. Get behind me. Get away from me. Because it is written, you shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Amen. You can read that in the King James and the NIV and the Living Bible. I don't care. It's going to tell you the same thing. We worship God alone. Amen. We serve God. That's what we do. We don't serve us. We don't serve them. We don't serve anybody but God. In service to God, we serve others. In service to God, we go live our lives. In service to God, we should be doing everything. And if you put that kind of a filter on it, if you think about something for a second, if you start filtering those decisions through, I know right and wrong, maybe sometimes those are concepts we have trouble getting our head around as humans, okay? Try this, though, for the filter. Instead of right and wrong, is this, whatever it is, honoring God? I mean, that doesn't feel different, that right or wrong. Does this honor God? Is this serving God? Or is it not? Is this worshiping God? Or is it not? I mean, if you put that kind of a filter on it, tell me that doesn't make some decisions easier. I mean, we like to get caught up in moral dilemmas and stuff sometimes. It doesn't need to be. 
is it is doing this serving God? Is doing this honoring God? Is doing this putting forth a witness that a child of God should be putting forth? And I'm not trying to judge you. I don't know what you guys are doing. I'm just saying that is in my decision-making paradigm. Not that I'm perfect at it, but that's what it has to come down to if we want the right and wrong of a thing. That's how Jesus answered. And in verse 11 says, And the devil left him, and the angels came and ministered to him. This is another piece at the end that tells me at the beginning, he set aside that divine power because the angels came and actually ministered to him. They came and took care of him. Now being God, he wouldn't need anybody to take care of him. But being a man, all that time in the desert, yeah, he needed something. And the angels came. Now there's, an, there's another thing I want to close with here. Luke tells us, like I said, about the same story. just flips a couple of, the, of what happened. But in 13, he says something just a little extra. He says, when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Luke says he departed for a season. What I love is all three of those gospel writers write about the story. Like I said, Mark gives you like two verses. It's pretty short. But each brings something special. Luke tells us they departed for a season. Mark tells us he was with the wild animals. And if you never read the, the passage in Mark, you wouldn't have even thought about that. But something here. We can have victory over that temptation. We can have victory over the evil one. We can have victory over the nature that is within us. One thing to think about is James tells us, because we're not perfect like Jesus was, or Adam was before he sinned, we have a nature to sin. We don't even need an enemy to come against us. We can do it all on our own. Right within us is all we need to draw us away from God. So we contend with that every day, along with other things. But even when we have victory, guys, there's going to be another one coming. Satan did not leave Jesus alone forever after this event. Some people would argue that part of that struggle uh, in Gethsemane was about following through. As it's right on the, the evening of happening. When Jesus is looking forward to not just the suffering he was going to have to go through, but the idea that God himself would be separated, the Father from the Son. In that moment when he took our sins on for us. And in that moment, may be tempted again. The only reason I would think that's a possibility is because toward the end of it, he says, even so. Thy will, God. Thy will, that's what I'm going to do. That sounded to me like somebody made a decision. So, even when we win, there's got to be another one. Until Jesus comes for us, guys, there will continue to be temptations. There will continue to be times we spend in the wilderness. There's going to be times when we struggle with ideas and thoughts and feelings and issues and decisions. 